prazer e honra de declarar aberta a 11 a, a CONFOA, a 11 primeira Conferência Luz Brasileira de Ciência Aberta, e, 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 e passo desde já a palavra ao Sr. Reitor, o professor Rui Vieira de Castro. Sr. Reitor, por favor. Muito obrigado, Dr. Ivaldo Rodrigues. Muito boa tarde e, ou muito, e, e muito bom dia, consoante o local onde as pessoas se encontram. Eu devo começar por saudar a Sra. Diretora do Instituto Brasileiro de Informação e Ciência e Tecnologia, a professora Cecília Leite, e a Sra. Presidente da Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia, a professora Helena, Helena Pereira. Um, um cumprimento também aos membros da Comissão Científica e da Comissão Organizadora da, da CONFOA, aos conferencistas, enfim, a todos os participantes nesta 11ª eh, CONFOA. Em nome da Universidade do Minho, de facto, queria saudar todos os participantes. É um privilégio para nós ver realizar-se esta edição da CONFOA na Universidade, ainda que nesta modalidade eh, à distância, dez anos depois de a primeira conferência, então em registro físico, aqui ter tido, ter tido lugar. Permitam-me uma, uma saudação, de facto, especial aos membros também da Comissão Organizadora e da Comissão Científica, que, em circunstâncias reconhecidamente difíceis, asseguraram a realização do evento. E, e este é mais um sinal da vitalidade, quer da conferência, quer da comunidade, que lhe dá, que lhe dá corpo. Para nós, aqui na, na Universidade do Minho, é gratificante verificar que a aposta que, a aposta que fizemos há, há quase... 20 anos e que desde aí vimos continuando no acesso aberto e na ciência aberta, se revelou correta, ao ter contribuído, como julgamos contribuir, de forma significativa para o desenvolvimento, seja das comunidades científicas, seja do próprio sistema científico. O facto de a CONFOA, nesta edição, ter, como o Dr. Eloy Rodrigues há bocado mencionou, o interesse de tantos participantes, algumas sessões terão, como, como foi mencionado, cerca de 500 inscritos, confirma que a cooperação entre as instituições e as comunidades científicas portuguesa e, e brasileira tem um elevado eh, potencial de promoção da qualidade e da visibilidade do trabalho que se vai fazendo do, de um e do outro lado do oceano sobre as práticas, as políticas e os requisitos eh, de infraestrutura da ciência, da ciência aberta, aberta. Neste domínio, diria como, como aliás em, em tantos outros, a colaboração entre instituições e entre países tem estado na origem de importantes saltos qualitativos. É pelo menos isso que a nossa experiência institucional, que a experiência, que a experiência da Universidade do Minho nos, nos mostra. Eu deixaria três ou quatro notas sobre momentos marcantes deste percurso que reforçam essa convicção sobre a importância da colaboração entre instituições e entre países. Perspectivando no primeiro momento o contexto uh, português, foi o que aconteceu com o, o projeto Repositório Científico de Acesso Aberto uh, em Portugal, uh, cuja atividade se iniciou em 2008, que envolveu várias instituições uh, portuguesas que assumiram como missão, plenamente conseguida, deve dizer-se, promover uh, e apoiar a opção pelo acesso aberto em Portugal. Mas foi também assim, com a cooperação entre a Universidade do Minho e instituições brasileiras, desde logo o IBICT, mas também a, a USP, a Universidade Federal da Bahia e a Fiocruz, que nos vem permitindo alicerçar diversas iniciativas em prol da ciência aberta. Foi também o que decorreu do memorando de entendimento, primeiro aquele que celebrámos em 2009, entre Portugal e Brasil, depois revisto há dois anos, Uh, e que permitiu, de facto, reforçar a cooperação já existente, alargada agora aos domínios, ao domínio dos dados de investigação e envolvendo iniciativas diversas, relativas seja à partilha de infraestruturas, seja ao desenvolvimento de ações conjuntas de capacitação, de que, o, o, de que a CONFOA é, é também um bom exemplo. E foi por fim, e por aqui fechava este conjunto, este conjunto de referências, o que ocorreu com o estabelecimento da Open Air uma entidade orientada para a promoção da ciência aberta, através de uma infraestrutura de comunicação académica e científica, moderna, aberta e sustentável, e que hoje envolve 36, 36 eh, entidades. De facto, há um elemento comum a esses episódios da participação da Universidade do Minho no movimento, no movimento da ciência aberta. 
a cooperação interinstitucional e internacional é sempre um poderoso fator de transformação dos estados de coisas. Tal como tem acontecido até hoje, a Universidade do Minho continuará disponível para prosseguir com os nossos parceiros e este caminho de aprofundamento do compromisso com os princípios e as práticas da ciência aberta, com a partilha de experiências, com a concepção e desenvolvimento conjunto de novos projetos. Estou certo que as, as apresentações, as discussões, os debates que vão ter lugar nesta 11ª CONFOA darão contributos importantes para a afirmação do movimento da ciência aberta, que é, e é bom recordá-lo sempre, um movimento de grande relevância científica e educacional, mas também económica e, e, e social. Resta-me desejar votos de bom trabalho para todos os participantes nesta conferência, que à semelhança das outras será certamente um sucesso. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Sr. Reitor. E convidava agora então a professora Helena Pereira, a Presidente da Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia, a, a, também a, a fazer a sua intervenção de abertura nesta confoa. Boa professora. Muito boa tarde, ou bom dia a todos. É um prazer estar aqui nesta Conferência Luso-Brasileira da Ciência Aberta. Cumprimento uh, todos os participantes, cumprimento muito especialmente os organizadores desta conferência e cumprimento também os meus colegas deste, uh, desta sessão de, de abertura. A ciência aberta é um tema importante e da maior relevância para o desenvolvimento do conhecimento e para o seu impacto na sociedade. A IFCT defende a ciência aberta desde há muito. A IFCT, a Fundação para a Ciência e a Tecnologia, que muitos de, de vós conhece, conheceis, é a agência nacional responsável pelo financiamento à comunidade científica, através do apoio a centros de investigação, infraestruturas científicas, emprego científico e formação avançada de doutoramentos, de doutorados, projetos, cooperação internacional, assim como instrumentos transversais de apoio, como sejam a, a computação avançada, a disponibilização de ferramentas digitais e o acesso a publicações científicas. Deste modo, e, e tendo em conta a sua, a sua missão e o seu quadro de atividade, Portanto, deste modo, a posição da IFCT quanto à ciência aberta tem um impacto importante na adoção de práticas pelos investigadores e pelas suas instituições. Ora, a IFCT defende, desde há muito, a disponibilização dos resultados da investigação científica através da internet, de uma forma aberta, livre e sem custos para o utilizador. As políticas de acesso aberto da IFCT entraram em vigor já Há alguns anos, foi a 5 de maio de 2014, e englobam regras e recomendações para o acesso livre e online a publicações sujeitas à revisão por pares, assim como aos dados que resultam da investigação científica que é financiada pela IFCT. As publicações, já foi referido, devem ser depositadas num dos repositórios em acesso aberto, do Repositório Científico de Acesso Aberto de Portugal logo possível, e de preferência por altura da aceitação da publicação. Este repositório é, no nosso entender, um repositório que detém um papel essencial no aumento da visibilidade das universidades e dos centros de ID portugueses na internet, assim como na rápida expansão dos repositórios institucionais de acesso aberto a nível nacional. Esta política eh, que Portugal tem, 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 tem levado a cabo, assim como a IFCT, levou ao seu reconhecimento pela Europa como política inovadora em matéria de acesso aberto. É de realçar que uma das componentes de desenvolvimento da European Research Area foi muito recentemente reforçada através da comunicação da Comissão Europeia se refere especificamente ao papel da ciência aberta e à sua importância. O Portugal e o Brasil têm já um longo historial de cooperação na área da ciência aberta. Logo, um bom exemplo é esta conferência, que se realiza desde 2009, que foi o ano da assinatura do Memorando de Entendimento entre os dois países. 
E esta cooperação foi reforçada mais recentemente, em 2018, com o um novo memorando de, de atendimento que prevê o seu alargamento para outras áreas, tais como os dados eh, de investigação, a capacitação dos recursos humanos e a cooperação luso-brasileira no apoio a outros países eh, com língua portuguesa, outros países da, CP, da Cplt. Isto mostra que temos aqui, portanto, um campo vasto de cooperação entre os dois países e temáticas muito interessantes para desenvolvermos. Termino desejando-vos uma boa conferência e certamente excelentes resultados. Até breve. Muito, muito obrigado, professora. E, e convido agora a professora Cecília Leite para, para fazer a última intervenção aqui nesta sessão de abertura como o IBICT, representante do IBICT, que é um, um dos organizadores da CONFOA desde o primeiro dia. Bom, bom dia para quem está no Brasil, boa tarde para quem está em Portugal. Eu quero dizer da grande alegria de estar aqui hoje abrindo a 11ª Conferência Luso-Brasileira de Ciência Aberta. Eu queria começar cumprimentando o magnífico reitor da Universidade do Minho, Dr. Rui Vieira, a doutora Helena Pereira, presidente da Fundação para a Ciência e Tecnologia de Portugal. E eu gostaria de cumprimentar muito especialmente a doutora Bianca Amaro, que é a pessoa no Brasil que tra trata deste tema. E a ciência aberta para nós é algo muito importante. O Brasil lidera isso e a gente deve muito à Bianca. E também uh, o doutor Eloy, que é a nossa parte portuguesa, porque eles dois e suas equipes conseguem levar esse trabalho de profunda importância para todos nós. Cumprimentar a todos que, de alguma maneira, fizeram com que esse evento pudesse se tornar uma realidade, e aqueles que estão nos ouvindo, porque, afinal de contas, nós trabalhamos para isso, para que isso possa ser passado, para que isso possa ser compartilhado, e, dessa forma, o conhecimento avançar e as pessoas crescerem nas suas áreas, e isso é o grande ganho para todos nós. É, em 1920, celebramos os 10 anos da CONFOA. Ao longo de sua trajetória, de voos alternados sobre o Oceano Atlântico, entre o Brasil e Portugal, é, tem direcionado esforços para o fortalecimento e consolidação de um espaço de discussão luso-brasileira sobre acesso aberto à informação científica e hoje, em um aspecto maior, a ciência aberta. Vimos o impulsionar, ao longo desses anos, de inúmeras ações que geraram frutos belíssimos, tanto para as três organizações, instituições organizadoras deste evento, mas, sobretudo, para as demais instituições de ensino e pesquisa e para os pesquisadores da área. Vimos o aumento das pesquisas científicas na área e o quanto isso faz avançar as discussões nesse campo. Vimos a formação de um público das CONFOAS, que a todo ano se mostra presente nos eventos, seja no Brasil, seja em Portugal, e as amizades que surgiram. Vimos a consolidação da CONFOA como um dos eventos principais da área e, dessa forma, estreitando os laços entre Brasil e Portugal a partir do acesso aberto. Temos uma edição da CONFOA realizada em formato distinto, online, em virtude da pandemia que estamos enfrentando e desse novo mundo que surge a partir daí, e que nós temos que nos reinventar e nos adaptarmos a essa nova realidade. Mas temos em mente que falar de ciência aberta, ainda mais nos tempos atuais, é termos claro que a ciência aberta é instrumento essencial para enfrentarmos os desafios que hoje a ciência nos apresenta. Mais que nunca, a abertura do processo científico, o compartilhamento, a disseminação e o acesso à ciência sem quaisquer restrições, e a realização de discussões em torno disso, nos mostram o quão fundamental é para a sociedade. Os seus impactos sociais e econômicos são uh, imensos. Prova disso são os altos números de submissões de trabalhos recebidos e de inscritos nessa edição, mostrando o interesse da comunidade científica luso-brasileira nessa discussão. Assim, Gostaria de desejar uma ótima conferência a todos, que mesmo online, tenho a certeza que será grandiosa,
como tem sido ao longo dos anos. Serão três dias ricos de muitas apresentações, celebrações e de espaços de aprendizagem e a comissão organizadora científica também uh, eu cumprimento nesse momento. Gostaria de desejar sucesso em todos esses dias, agradecer por nos receber, mesmo virtualmente em Portugal, e esperamos no próximo ano uh, podermos receber no Brasil presencialmente, porque nos traz uma grande alegria, fortalece não só o conhecimento, o acesso aberto, que a gente trabalha há bastante tempo, mas a, as amizades que foram surgindo e que foram se consolidando ao longo desses 10 anos. Obrigada a todos e sucesso. Muito, muito obrigado, muito obrigado a, a, a todos, ao professor Oliveira Castro, à professora Helena e à, e à professora Cecília, por esta, por esta participação, que nós também gostaríamos que tivesse sido presencial, mas hoje, este ano, toda a confoa é a remota. Vamos passar, desde já, para a, a primeira sessão da confoa para, para, para a conferência de, de abertura. Uh, 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 Amy Brand, uh, I will uh, start presenting you in Portuguese. Uh, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to be here with us today, but I will start presenting you in Portuguese and then I will get back to you again in, in English. Uh, é um, é um grande prazer e uma grande honra e foi, foi com, com muita alegria que, que, que a Amy Brand aceitou o convite para, para, para estar connosco na, na Confoa. Também gostaríamos que eu tivesse presencialmente se a Confoa se realizasse nesse formato, porque a Amy Brand é de facto um, uma, uma, uma pessoa muito relevante em, em todo este domínio, Uh, portanto, fazendo, e portanto é uma, uma excelente forma de abrirmos aqui a, a conferência. A Amy Brand é presentemente a diretora da MIT Press, uma, como é sabido, uma das maiores editoras universitárias do mundo, e que é conhecida uh, quer pelas suas uh, publicações, uh, digamos, em áreas emergentes, não apenas digamos, na, em, em, sobre temas tradicionais, mas em áreas, digamos, ou, ou temas emergentes, e, e também pelo, pela... pela pela utilização e, e pioneira em alguns aspectos, digamos, do uso da tecnologia, e exatamente a Amy Brand está a, a, a participar também num desses grupos. Aliás, quero dizer que recentemente, até por, 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 um, por um trabalho que estou a fazer, tive uh, uh, o, o prazer de, de ler um dos livros que, o, que a MIT Press uh, uh, publicou este ano, que é o que eu, que eu recomendo, que é um livro sobre a questão da manipulação das métricas. Uh, uh, e, e o seu impacto na, nos sistemas de avaliação académica. O livro que se chama Gaming the Metrics, e, portanto, é, um, é um livro excelente e uma das, exatamente disponível uh, em, em versões uh, comerciais, em, mas também em acesso aberto, portanto, e é um livro que eu já agora aproveito para recomendar a todos. Uh, a Amy Brand participou, uh, em, tem uma carreira uh, uh, muito diversificada, ela é doutorada também pelo MIT em Ciências Cognitivas, uh, uh, ocupou já vários cargos em, em termos de comunicação académica, nomeadamente no MIT, na Digital Digital Science e na Universidade de Harvard, mas, digamos, é a diretora do MIT Press desde 2015, como referi. E, e foi uma das cofundadoras de uma das iniciativas que eu acho também muito interessante neste domínio da comunicação científica, que chama-se Knowledge Futures Group, pronto, que, é um, que é exatamente um grupo que tenta reunir gente da comunicação académica e das tecnologias para, digamos, imaginar e propor formas inovadoras para a comunicação científica. Mas ela também está envolvida num conjunto de outras organizações, como a Crossref, a Creative Commons, a Royal Society for Chemistry, etc. E, e finalmente, também é também produtora executiva do, do, de um filme uh, chamado Picture a Scientist, uh, um filme, de, digamos, de 2020, que é sobre as mulheres na ciência e de como tornar a ciência mais diversificada, mais plural, mais justa e, e equitativa. So, uh, thank you very much, Amy. It's really a pleasure and an, uh, an honor to have you with us here today. Thank you very much to, to, to be available to uh, be, uh, I know it's early also for you there. So thank you very much to, 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 uh, to be with us today. And uh, the floor uh, uh, is yours. Let me just say one other thing in Portuguese because I forgot mm -hmm. that people can ask you questions in, in, in Portuguese. Uh, como eu referi uh, no início, uh, uh, vocês podem utilizar uh, 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 a funcionalidade Q&A ou depois no final levantar a mão para falar. Uh, se quiserem, podem colocar as questões logo em inglês, preferencialmente, mas se preferirem, 
podem também colocar as questões em, em português e eu uh, uh, traduzirei para inglês. So, Amy, uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours. May share your slides, please. Okay. We already see your slides, not in pre yeah. presentation um, mode. Let's see. Okay. How's that? Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good. So, good afternoon and, and thank you. Obrigada e boa tarde. Um, it was interesting to be listening to all those opening remarks and realize that I have no way of knowing whether anything I'll say will repeat things that have already been said. But I'm truly honored to be delivering the opening keynote at the 11th Portuguese Brazilian Open Science Conference. I'm of course saddened that the event isn't happening in person when I would have had the opportunity to meet with many of you face to face, but it does feel meaningful to be giving this talk during a global pandemic because COVID-19 has been has brought into even sharper focus how important access to credible research information is not only for scientists, but all, also for policymakers and the global public. Um, and it's brought into focus um, the need to accelerate changes in how we disseminate research. I know that all of you attending this conference, and I can see there are something like 250 people, share the belief that advances in science and technology and how those advances are communicated are our strongest ammunition in facing urgent global challenges like COVID-19, like climate change. Um, and it's, so it's very humbling for me to be keynoting a conference about the vast subject of open science, the movement towards open methods, data, and software. And speakers over the next three days will deliver uh, talks on such varied topics as open peer review and ethics and copyright, data repositories, fair principles, interoperability, and so on. So publication, which is where my expertise, expertise is, is really only one step um, in research communication processes that start with the collection and analysis of data uh, and proceed all the way through the assessment of research imp impact. Now, if, if the information wars, and they are information wars, being waged in recent times, you know, in the news media, on social platforms, have taught us nothing else, they have shown us just how inextricable information is from the systems that host and deliver it. And the same holds for scientific information. Knowledge and science for public good require communi communication systems that aren't controlled by market values. It may be too early to say precisely what the longer term impact of this crisis will be for libraries, publishers, and other stakeholders in the information arena. But it's already clear that the changes will be significant and long lasting. Consider the pandemic's effect on university and library budgets, on research funding, on scientific conferences like this one, on the pace of clinical trials, and of course, on the explosion of preprint publishing, which I'll come back to. So crises on the scale can be tremendous opportunities. And uh, my main goal today is to help us envision a future in which the infrastructure to share, access, curate, and build upon scientific knowledge is con controlled in large part by academic communities rather than commercial monoliths. Um, now in that regard, I also acknowledge that Latin American Spanish in Portuguese science publishing and institutional support have long been way out in front here, certainly way out in front of the United States. The title of my keynote today comes from a recent paper in science that I co-authored with Claudio Espezi of Spark, uh, in which we explain why open content on its own is not only insufficient for a thriving open science ecosystem, but it has also produced some unintended and undesirable consequences. Now, uh, just for a little comic relief, uh, no surprise that the article in question currently sits behind a paywall uh, and several of my friends have been amused to point this out to me. Even so, estimates today put the percentage of articles that are open by design at well above the halfway mark. Uh, and a number of recent developments such as Plan S 
make us confident that open access upon publication will be the default in the sciences within the next several years. But will that really democratize science in the ways that we all hope that it would? So we celebrate the steep rise in openly accessible research content and at the same time that we acknowledge that it will not on its own turn out to be the solution that many in the research community were hoping for as long as the platforms for delivering and computing over that content remain subject to proprietary systems and commercial monopolies. Hence, knowledge infrastructure has become the new frontier for advocates of open science, as I'm sure you all appreciate. Uh, this observation is by no means new or unique. Uh, looking back to a transformative paper uh, written in 2015 by Jeff Builder of Crossref, Jennifer Lynn, and Cameron Nalen, in which they stated so powerfully, everything we have gained by opening content and data will be under threat if we allow the enclosure of scholarly infrastructures. So the drive to open science and democratize its communications um, our platforms and technologies for doing so are key. And I'll talk today about several new developments in knowledge infrastructure, and also about the importance of taking an ecosystemic rather than oversimplified or shallow approach. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. So as you know, infrastructure in this context refers to the technical substrate on which we produce and share knowledge. Now, as a mission-driven publisher, I have to accept that I can't build or control this on my own, and publishers can't. Um, publishers like me are content people and business people, and especially smaller and more mission-driven publishers have historically outsourced the technologies that we publish our content on. Um, on the other hand, infrastructure is, by definition, distributed and interoperable. Platforms, systems, metadata standards, licenses, and even business models. Uh, and consider that communication, science communication is a complex system, which means it requires complex interventions. So not only are our powerful market forces at play here, but how we publish is deeply connected with the research life cycle. Uh, when you consider the interplay among authorship, diverse measures of impact and academic career advancement, for example. Hence our solutions need to account for these relationships and interactions. When our interventions do not adequately capture the underlying complexity of the problem or anticipate underlying forces, they're more likely to have unintended consequences. So when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web, his main objective, according to what he said, was to enable researchers to share their work. Not only have our research communication tools fallen short of leveraging all the linking and access and decentralized authority that the web makes possible, but the history of the web reminds us that making vast amounts of linked data readily accessible to third parties has triggered a number of unintended consequences. The success of a limited number of social networks, shopping services, and search engines shows us that internet platforms based on data and analytics tend towards monopoly. Now the history of the open access movement is itself a lesson in unintended outcomes. So let's uh, take a little detour into how we got here in open access. In 1994, a cognitive scientist named Stephen Harnad posted a subversive proposal to a mailing list calling on researchers to make copies of all their published papers freely available on the internet. The term open access wasn't introduced until 2001 by the drafters of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, Peter Suber among them. And when it started gaining ground in the early 2000s, uh, the open access movement focused on green OA, on self-archiving, researchers uploading a version of a paper to a subject or institutional repository. Now, just my own personal involvement, Harvard launched the first faculty US self-archiving policy in 2008, and I very much wanted to be part of this new movement towards greater institutional control of scholarly information, and so I left Crossref, where I had been one of the earlier employees uh, to manage the Harvard Scholarly Communications Program. At the time, the agreements that most publishers had their authors sign did not create barriers for self-archiving. Self and so, you know, our outlook for green or university controlled open access was very positive. But institutional repositories in many parts of the world were slow to realize their full potential to create 
a robust Academy-owned record of scholarship, and we're not there yet. Um, on the one hand, in my own experience in the US, it was very tough to incentivize faculty to deposit their work. Uh, and even more so, universities, at least in the US, did not muster the needed level of financial and technical investment or multi-university cooperation. Shifting publisher policies on self-archiving also played a big role in this. Um, consider that the original 2004 Elsevier policy required no embargoes in self-archiving. In later years, 90% of Elsevier journals would have embargo periods of 12 months or more, and many publishers and societies followed suit. At the same time, new pay to publish or gold OA journals emerged um, and larger publishers up their investments in services to manage research workflows, metadata and analytics. These developments significantly slowed institutional cooperation on open access and shared infrastructure. Now, it's hard to know if this was an intentional divide and conquer strategy, but this is how uh, Elsevier describes its main business objectives today, to be a data platform for supporting business decisions at research institutions. Now, to win at this strategy, it needs to have as much data and content as possible, a lot of which it gets uh, through open sources. Uh, it needs funds to invest in cutting edge technology, which it certainly has, and it, um, it needs strategies for reducing competition. And in this context, you can understand why green open access is much more of a threat than gold open access. So I think we need to question recent developments like transformative agreements because they lock us further into gold or paid open access. Not only that, transformative read and publish agreements, uh, which are sometimes called pure publish, in which library subscription terms and open access fees are bundled into a single contract, also have the potential to influence where researchers opt to publish their work, which contra contravenes basic principles of academic freedom. So thus far, this model has tended to advantage commercial publishers and large societies over smaller, more mission-driven uh, publishers. So what we mean by open access today and where the open access movement started are very different. What was intended primarily to grow the role of li libraries and universities in capturing and disseminating the fruits of scholarship has today been subsumed by pay to publish models, mainly under the control of large commercial companies. Such models can disadvantage particular scholars, societies, uh, fields, or even regions of the world and have thus far failed to dismantle the monopolies held by these larger publishers. Uh, note this very recent headline, open access fees uh, creating a crisis for African research. So how do we get back to green where we started? One of the hopeful trends that we're seeing today is a renewed focus on repositories uh, and self-archiving through the work of organizations like CORE, an international association with members and partners from over 50 countries around the world, representing libraries, universities, research institutions, and funders. Its Next Generation Repositories Initiative aims to, and I quote, position repositories as the foundation for a distributed globally networked infrastructure for scholarly information, on top of which um, layers of value added services will be deployed, will also collectively um, managed by the scholarly community. So this is all good. Uh, the question remains, will the institutions we need at the center here step up? Where will that sustaining investment in infrastructure come from and who owns the roadmap? So if the goal is to build a viable alternative to proprietary publishing models, then we know that open publishing needs new infrastructure that incentivizes sustainability, cooperation, and integration. Uh, the good news is, is there's a lot of development happening in this space. And last year, the MIT Press issued a Mellon-funded report called Mind the Gap, a landscape analysis of open source publishing tools and platforms which uh, catalogs and analyzes over 60 open source uh, software platforms for publishing. Now the report also warns that open publishing must grapple with the dual challenges of silo development uh, and the organization of the community owned ecosystem. 
You're also probably aware of Invest in Open Infrastructure, IOI, a new effort to enable durable, scalable, and long-lasting open scientific and scholarly infrastructure. Uh, in talking to Caitlin Thaney, who was recently appointed as Executive Director, uh, a former colleague from, from Digital Science, and others leading this charge, it sounds like the goal is to become a central clearinghouse or regranting program for funding and curating open source projects all good again, as long as this top-down approach doesn't hamper uh, innovation and competition. Uh, you may be less aware of this, but in the United States, there's also significant federal investment in open knowledge infrastructure. In 2018, the NSF launched a generously funded accelerator program to enable the creation of a non-proprietary shared knowledge infrastructure. Uh, quote, an open knowledge network would be available to all stakeholders, including the researchers who will help push this technology further. It requires a non-proprietary public-private development effort that spans the entire data science community and will result in an open shared infrastructure. And at MIT, as uh, Eli mentioned, um, we launched in 2018 the Knowledge Futures Group, which has the twofold goal of uh, incubating homegrown technologies and sparking a movement towards greater institutional investment in knowledge infrastructure. Now in our more kind of bottom up organic vision of the future of scholarly infrastructure, we develop ways for centers of innovation to cooperate, interop interoperate and compete without predetermining where the investment should flow. Um, I won't go into too much detail on knowledge futures uh, at this point other than to uh, mention our PubPub open community publishing platform, which is used by communities around the world for a vast range of pub publishing needs, more traditional journals and books, uh, but also conferences, policy documents, uh, new forms of work. Um, it provides a strong support around multimedia and data. Um, it's been really transformative for the MIT press and I'll just point to how quickly it allowed us to respond to the COVID-19 crisis by making relevant book and journal resources available right away, um, something that would have been much harder for us to do had we outsourced this response to a third party technology provider, which is the case for most publishers. Uh, another example of a PubPub community out of the hundreds of communities using the platform, we host the audiovisual preprints that Africa Archive uh, publishes. Um, Typically their content is on the OSF Center for Open Science platform, but um, that is unable to support the audiovisual visual uh, preprints. Um, so we're partnering there. Uh, less in the scholarly space, Mexico City has been using a platform for a few years for experiments in digital democracy and crowdsourced governance, uh, such as this uh, current example. The platform also gives us the flexibility to experiment with rapid responsive publishing models, such as the overlay journal that we launched this summer called Rapid Reviews COVID-19, um, which addresses what we see as the infodemic and the very real dangers that result from misinformation and misuse of research content. So yes, we want more rapid and open dissemination, but we don't want scientific claims that haven't been vetted in any way to be misused or misinterpreted as they often are. And this speaks to the point that I raised earlier about the importance of ecosystemic effects. So as one of the key pieces of infrastructure is changing as it should, moving from bespoke publisher platforms to open preprint servers as our hosting sub substrate, what else in this complex system needs to change? While preprint servers offer a mechanism to disseminate world-changing scientific research at unprecedented speed, we have seen that they are also a forum through which misleading information can undermine international scientific developments, the community's credibility, can destabilize dis diplomatic relationships and compromise global safety. Consider uh, recent new coverage of an unvetted claim that the virus causing the pandemic was manufactured in a Chinese lab. Uh, the original study was posted on a public preprint server without the benefit of peer review. Now, while this research has been debunked in some popular media, there are channels like, like Fox News that perpetuate misinformation. So scholarly peer review represents 
a strong rebuke from the scientific community uh, and Rapid Reviews COVID-19 just posted several open reviews of this paper to once and for all debunk its misleading and potentially harmful claims. Uh, and just as we hoped, we're already beginning to see, this is just from yesterday, our efforts circle back into uh, the global news media as we had hoped. Um, so uh, as uh, was mentioned and, and I would emphasize, the MIT Press is also a book publisher. It's the core of what we do. We produce lots of books on the topics of knowledge and media and information. And I'm reminded you know, every day of what a tremendous privilege it is to run a mission-driven publishing company uh, and of how powerfully uh, good books continue to influence our world. And so I feel um, a strong responsibility to use that perch for good wherever I can. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do um, is uh, produce a sustainable open monograph model. We recently got funding from Arcadia uh, to pilot a new model, which is closely aligned with the subscribe to open model in the journal space. Uh, and our hope is that this will prove useful to the broader community of mission-driven academic publishers down the road. Uh, this underscores the point that business models are also a, a form of shared infrastructure. Our digital licenses are another fundamental component of open in infrastructure, and there are several opportunities that I see for greater interoperability between license metadata and other discovery systems, opportunities for the licenses themselves to evolve to better suit the practical needs of creators and publishers, um, and thinking about sustainable open access publishing for both books and journals. And as a member of the Board of Creative Commons, I personally question what I see as an overly ideological focus on CC BY and CC zero licenses. I believe that publishers should have the option to make content open without relinquishing control over how it's monetized or repurposed downstream. Um, I suspect there are people listening today who don't agree with that point of view. Uh, but when I publish an open access digital book, my business model for making it open in the first place inc includes a component of print or print on demand sales to the academic community. If other entities or agents can compete with my print revenues, I, it, it in inadvertently hurts the mission by cannibalizing the sustainability of OA publication. And this is another example of where considering the broader ecosystem uh, comes into play. So let me begin to wind down and, and summarize my message here. Research universities are in the business of creating and transmitting knowledge, yet they have historically underinvested in capturing and communicating the knowledge being created on their campuses, having outsourced much of the relevant functions and infrastructure, including not only publishing, but also the design and tracking of metrics upon which academic, academic reputations are judged. So as we come to terms with the fact that established models and practices are increasingly unfit for purpose in a world of shrinking library bu budgets, overpriced journals, unpurchased monographs, uh, and monopolistic analytics platforms, the imperative grows for universities themselves to assume a greater knowledge dissemination and infrastructure role. So how do we build a more sustainable university-centric publishing ecosystem? How do we foster collaboration and collective investment within and across universities? And at the same time, how do we avoid reinventing the wheel of academic publishing through new efforts that overlook or devalue the expertise and skill sets of publishing professionals? We know that healthy, resilient ecosystems require diversity, cooperation, and competition. How do we avoid creating monocultures within our research and publishing ecosystems? And how do we better anticipate the future consequences of the models, models and the policies that we adopt? Uh, big publishers can't do it on their own, but neither can the library community do it on their own. Um, and they definitely shouldn't be reinventing what publishers already do. So the time is ripe for greater multi-stakeholder coordination and institutional investment in building and maintaining a diversified open infrastructure pipeline. In closing, the battle for control over information and knowledge is a defining struggle of our time, and it is a battle over infrastructure broadly defined. And my goal today was to help you envision a future where the infrastructure to share, access, and curate knowledge is controlled by a village. Um, 
whatever healthy competition in this space looks like, uh, the time has come for universities and knowledge institutions to assume a larger role in mitigating the risks that arise from ongoing consolidation in research infrastructure, uh, including the privatization of community platforms, which happens all the time, uh, commercial control of analytic solutions, and other market-driven trends in scientific and scholarly publishing. Uh, for myself, there are still many challenges that keep my brain churning at night. How do we define excellence and contribution in the production of new knowledge going forward? Is peer review an adequate quali quality control measure and how do we make it better? Uh, how will we incentivize researchers to share their data in the first place? Um, I could go on, but thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you today over Zoom and I hope my comments uh, will spark conversation during the conference over the next few days. Uh, and now back to the moderator for what I hope will be a, a robust uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for your wonderful uh, presentation. I'm sure that uh, if we were face to face, you will have a, a very big round <laughs> of applause for your for magnificent you. uh, presentation. So. Uh, uh, I have also uh, some questions, but I will not use my position because uh, I, I was sure about that. We already have a couple of questions. So we have one in English. I think you can read it, uh, uh, Amy, if you go to Q&A. Otherwise, okay. I, can, I, can, I can do it. And then we have uh, also a question in Portuguese that I will translate. But maybe you should uh, start for a uh, reply to okay. the first one. Okay? Yeah. Um, the first question, the pandemic has shown the necessity to promptly publish data and papers. From now on, how, now on, how do you think initiatives such as preprints, open peer review uh, will develop? Um, yes, uh, that, that is right to the point. I do think that what's happening with the pandemic is it's accelerating a transition that was already happening um, towards uh, a model where, which is sometimes referred to you know, publish, uh, review, curate, PRC, where um, we use preprint servers, we use institutional repositories, peer review is layered on top of that. Uh, and there's a publication function that is around a curation of, you know, this open preprint content. I think there, there are many initiatives in this space uh, right now uh, trying to figure out how to, um, you know, build a, a peer review layer that interacts effect, effectively with the preprint server and, and repository layer. Um, and there are interesting technical challenges that come up. I'll give you one example. We were just working with Crossref because it turned out that although Crossref allows DOIs for preprints and, and DOIs for peer reviews, it doesn't allow DOIs for peer reviews of preprints. And so we've had to, <laughs> We've had to um, move that up on the development roadmap at Crossref to support what's happening now. Um, I think the next one is in Portuguese. I will, I will uh, translate it uh, to you. So it reads uh, investment in infrastructures, no, uh, uh, policies and, and guidelines, but uh, is not the time to change the way uh, uh, that we assess and reward uh, researchers. Um, I certainly believe it is. I actually think that that is the most pivotal question. And um, one of the, you know, I, I didn't expect to be coming back to MIT or to a publishing house. You know, I, I had been working on promotion and tenure. I loved working at digital science and this opportunity came up. And part of what made me interested is I thought if there's one institution that's going to look at publishing in terms of how it relates to the rest of the you know, ecosystem or research life cycle, it's Harvard. And I mean, it's, I'm sorry, it's MIT, absolutely not Harvard. Um, and, uh, and so it has been, but I will say um, it has been a bit of a challenge in addition to the, the job of you know, running a publisher that publishes 300 books a year or, or more, 350 and 40 journals to have that influence, but I, I work regularly to uh, try to influence administrators at MIT that they need to be focusing on the question of research evaluation and impact and to bring different tools and resources to their attention and to try to get them at least piloted uh, in new ways because um, 
you know, we, we the, the, you know, the real risk is, and this is what we talk about in the, in the, you know, the science paper, um, is that without even knowing it, these people in positions of powers, power at universities are uh, making key decisions that are uh, driven by opaque algorithms they don't necessarily understand that are very inflexible when it comes to understanding the differences between what impact looks like in different fields. Um, which have a tendency to exacerbate bias, for example, you know, if you're, if you're just looking at citation and impact factor, et cetera. Um, so to me, this is one of them, it really is the, I think the most interesting and transformative question. And I think about it a lot. So thank you for raising that. Yeah. I just just uh, a kind of a quick side note on, on the introduction. I said that I just uh, recently read the book that was also in your, in one of your Game slides, in the Game, Game in the Matrix, and I really recommend it. And I was really almost shocked when I realized that uh, on the seventies, Robert Merton, Merton the, the, the the American soci sociologist, warned Eugene Garfield about the consequences of yeah. introducing the general impact factor that yeah. uh, people will start gaming it and, uh, and it will be very, very unintended consequence. So it was, it's really a, a recommended reading for all of them to go read the game of the metrics and uh, maybe understand a little bit more what is going on on this realm. So uh, you have already uh, two other questions. Uh, uh, all right. Um, the third George. one, yes. Uh, how to mitigate the APC publishing strategy in return to green. Um, with, so, I, I think we need a multi-pronged approach here. Um, you know, I've, I've been very concerned about the position, frankly, that has been taken by the leadership of Plan S, um, which seems to, you know, I've had many conversation, conversations with people there uh, trying to explain why um, building in Plan S requirements that, uh, you know, essentially support an APC model where they have the opportunity uh, to really create change because of how uh, impactful and influential Plan S is. Um, you know, and the response has been, well, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just going from what exists today. Uh, I don't think that's the right response. Um, I do think that I, I tend to, if it wasn't clear from my comments, to have a, a kind of a a grassroots or, or bottom-up theory of change um, rather than top-down. And I, I think, you know, if we can invest in and create as CORE is trying to do much more um, powerful, uh, well-funded and interoperable, because the interoperability is key, institutional repositories, um, you know, that that is probably the most important uh, factor. Uh, yeah, and then as I said in the talk, um, read and publish agreements are, are, I think are very problematic. Okay, thank you. You have another question uh -huh. also related with uh, the reward system, but. Uh... Yeah, so there's one from Anna, um, let's see. No, 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 then... no the, 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 the Anna is, uh, is the end of the first question though you are uh, okay. in from, oh, Washington, yeah, from Washington. From Washington. From yeah. Washington. Um, how do you see we can act in changing measure system of rewards uh, to reinforce, and I think that's uh, thank thank you, Washington. I, I think that's related to the the impact question we were discussing earlier. So, to go back to what I just said about a particular theory or practice of change, you know, you often I'm often in these conversations with people who say, well, this is all well and good, but as long as you know the people that are making the decisions, the deans, the presidents, the provosts, still review tenure for tenure in a particular way, nothing's going to change. And I don't believe that. I think we can change um, how people are evaluated by giving them the tools to describe their contribution and their impact in a much more nuanced, rich way, right? So that one of the projects I'd worked on a few years back with several other people in the community was the, the contributor role taxonomy because we were seeing that as science became more collaborative and multi-authored, um, there were, you know, authors who were typically, you know, in the middle of the list of authors who might have been involved in things like software or data curation, who were not able to be recognized for their work, 
Um, so how do you create descriptors around what people contribute and then integrate those descriptors into machine readable metadata um, that could say, go into a report through ORCID um, you know, of, of someone's contribution. So that's, that's what I mean sort of by um, you know, more of a, a bottom up or grassroots. Uh, another related initiative is around uh, trying to describe different types of peer review and tag and capture that peer review as metadata so that we remove some of the bias against uh, open access publication venues. You know, if we can say that this monograph that's published with this new open access publisher is actually peer reviewed in a very rigorous way, um, you know, we, we get beyond whatever bias you know, someone on a committee might have that, I don't know the name of that press, I don't know the name of that publisher or that journal. Um, so can we, can we create signals of excellence and rigor that live outside of the current um, publishing ecosystem? Okay, we have a couple of questions and we yeah. will stop uh, here because uh, we need to manage time. Um, so I think we'll take the question of Bianca. Bianca? Um, one of the problems in Brazil is the lack of professionalism of our editors. Um, that, that is, uh, I, I assume you mean of, of journal editors. Um, and it is true, um, what, unlike when, when, you're, when you're in a publishing house that publishes both, both books and journals, it's a very different experience. The involvement of the staff of the press in the book publishing process, in the peer review process and managing that process uh, is so much more hands-on than in the journal publishing process where you know you 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 have editorial offices that sit outside the press that manage things. And um, you know, I don't think that we're perfect at this either. And we have some journal editors that are more professional than others. We've had journals that we've had to close down. Uh, but we do try to propagate best practices around peer review. Um, and to provide some standard system, say for you know, tracking submission management um, that we have done some insight into to create best practices, for example, around um, describing the, you know, how, how a particular journal handles the evaluation of manuscripts. Um, so that, I mean, that is, I don't, I don't have a, a robust answer to that question, but it, I'm, I'm glad you raised it because it, it is a very, very important question and you're absolutely right. The professionalism you know, of editors and journals um, varies greatly. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I will um, use my, my, my uh, share role here just to put you the, the, the last question. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, you, you raised the, 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 the main uh, challenges that uh, we may have to, to create that uh, community uh, or, or um, uh, institutionally uh, led uh, uh, scholarly communication system. And I think uh, we have uh, still questions of technologies and, the, uh, and uh, infrastructure. And I think for the technology, of course, there are still some gaps, but I think the, the real problem uh, does not uh, 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 realize there. The real question is, to have uh, infrastructure uh, institutions collectively uh, uh, investing on their infrastructures and on the interoperable uh, services that we need on top of them. So the question of investment and coordination of uh, of the institutions, and the, on the other hand, the question of engaging the the research community itself. Uh, and the, of course, we know it's difficult because of all the real reward system and uh, based on journals and impact factors uh, kind of push people the, on, the other, uh, for, for on the other direction. What do you think would be the, the, the priorities or what do you think we should put our effort uh, to change this, uh, the, this situation? Mm -hmm. um, we... That, that's also a big question. I mean, what, one thing that came to mind while you were asking it was, it's a, it's a small step, but little by little, we are seeing libraries that are moving away from the big deals, uh, canceling certain journals, you know, taking some of those savings and investing them in new open access initiatives. Um, I know when we work with the MIT library, 
Um, they've taken about 100,000 a year out of their collections budget and they put it towards our open access publishing. Um, and they like to, which I normally wasn't comfortable, they, they like to have a say in what they're funding. Uh, and they like to fund work that either comes from MIT faculty or is relevant to MIT research or, or interests. Um, and I, 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 I imagine we're, you know, we're not alone in having libraries that are increasingly kind of shifting the resources they have towards what their own institutions are doing on the publishing front. And of course there are, you know, there are more joined up um, efforts as well, such as, you know, the Tome Monograph Initiative uh, that, that uh, ARL runs. Um, you know, I, I am very um, supportive of the work in particular that Spark is doing in this space and, and that Claudio uh, is, is spearheading around producing resources and, and, and um, that are intended to influence key decision makers and shifting their attention to this, um, you know, to these questions with a focus to go back to the question that that Washington and others raised, with a focus on the on the analytics and business decision making, um, because that that's something they understand. Um, and so I would, you know, this if you have if you're not familiar with it, you should look at this the the Spark Roadmap for Change uh, as a good provi will provide much more you know detail and answer to your question than I have, and it's on the right track. So. Okay, so. Thank you very much, Amy. We, we must be very aware of time uh, as uh, yes. uh, managing an online event. Yes. Also because now we'll have two uh, parallel sessions starting uh, now at, at this moment. So thank you very much again for your participation. It was really inspiring uh, and very useful for sure, for, for both for Portuguese and Brazilian uh, uh, participants. And I really look forward to, to an opportunity to uh, to have you on, uh, on our um, uh, next face-to-face uh, -face e events and probably to discuss some of the, the ideas that uh, you have presented uh, as here. As you know, I'm, I'm involved on CORE. You mentioned the Next Generation Repository uh, 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 report. We have just also published, and I put the link on the chat, uh, a model for overlay uh, peer review services on top of that distributed info. So, I think uh, really there is a, 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 a big camp for collaboration. And as you say, there are uh, some uh, uh, good signs of uh, institutions and libraries and universities starting to uh, be interesting and investing on, on this realm. So thank you very much again. And I will switch to, to Portuguese to give some, just some final- uh, Thank you so much. It was a real honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. So, então, uh, terminamos esta primeira sessão, acho que foi excelente, uh, foi mesmo um privilégio termos aqui a Amy Brand. Como vocês sabem, agora temos duas sessões paralelas, portanto, peço-vos para se dirigirem para, conforme a sessão em que se inscreveram, estão aí os links, mas vocês já, devem ter, já os devem ter recebido. E no final das, da, 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 da sessão, uh, 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 portanto, às três e meia, devem voltar, digamos, a... a também para a, para a sala de plenário outra vez, e também já terão esses links e vão, e vão uh, vê-los novamente no final da sessão de Pecha Cuxa, onde, uh, onde teremos um, um coffee break com alguma música. Mas não queria deixar de, de vos convidar, diria quase de vos intimar, a estarem presentes na sessão de encerramento de hoje, que vai ser, um, vai ser o nosso momento social da Confo, o momento social possível, quando vamos ter um vídeo e, uma, e um desafio uh, aos vossos conhecimentos que traz um prémio associado. Portanto, vão para as, para as outras sessões. Muito obrigado pela vossa participação e já nos voltaremos a ver um pouco mais tarde. Muito obrigado.